In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1818 by our civilization. It's based on more than 20 earlier source maps, which Piri Reis told us went back in some cases to before the time of Christ. Have you ever imagined a world where the icy expanse of Antarctica was once a lush, verdant jungle? The Piri Race map, a mysterious cartographic relic crafted in 1513, might hold clues to such a forgotten past. The Earth's climate was very different from, from how it is today. There's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. Renowned for its astonishing precision and enigmatic depictions, this map intriguingly includes what some believe to be the coastline of Antarctica, mapped out centuries before its official discovery. This discovery raises tantalizing questions. Was Antarctica once free of ice, teeming with dense forests and diverse wildlife? And could ancient maps like the Piri Reis offer proof of Earth's dramatically shifting climates and landscapes? From time to time, the entire outer crust of the Earth, like the skin of an orange, might shift. If that happens, Antarctica oh. could have been in warmer latitudes and could have been shifted into colder latitudes. Join us as we delve into the secrets preserved within ancient maps, exploring a world vastly different from our own. In 1929, a remarkable discovery was made in the Topkapi Palace Library in Istanbul by Gustav Deismann. Amidst a collection of parchments, he unearthed the Piri Reis map, a world map drawn on gazelle skin by the Ottoman Turkish admiral and cartographer Piri Reis in 1513. So this map appears to incorporate many features that are not supposed to have been known about in 1513. This historical artifact has since captivated scholars, historians and conspiracy theorists alike, not just for its intricate detail and accuracy, but also for its enigmatic portrayals of the globe's coastlines, including what some believe to be the coastline of Antarctica. Why don't they see the same thing that you do? Oh, um, they think it's just fantasies of the map makers. Mapped over three centuries before its official discovery by a Russian expedition in 1820, the map is renowned for its astonishing precision in depicting various coastlines. For instance, the eastern coast of South America and the Caribbean islands are outlined with a precision that far surpasses many contemporary maps of the era. The Brazilian coastline is detailed with river inlets and capes, which many European maps at the time either overlooked or misrepresented. Moreover, the map is filled with annotations that provide a rich historical context, shedding light on the maritime knowledge of the early 16th century. These notes are not just practical, detailing crucial information about ocean currents, but also ethnographic, offering insights into the early encounters between Europeans and indigenous populations. The map even ventures into the realm of the mythical, with depictions of legendary islands and sea creatures that reflect the folklore and seafaring culture of the period. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the Piri Race map is its depiction of a southern landmass connected to South America by a narrow isthmus. I think we're looking at hints and clues that something is missing in our story. This portrayal includes detailed geographical features like mountain ranges, bays and inlets that bear a striking resemblance to the sub-glacial topography of Antarctica, as it might appear without its ice sheet. These details are speculative yet align curiously well with modern seismic data, despite the fact that this area was not officially discovered until 1820 and not accurately mapped without ice until much later with advanced seismic equipment. This unusual depiction on the map suggests that Admiral Piri Reis may have had access to source maps of remarkable antiquity and accuracy. It's based on more than 20 earlier source maps. That he put all these maps together and derived his own map from these. The theory surrounding the Piri Reis map opens a captivating chapter in the study of cartography and ancient civilizations, intertwining historical mysteries with speculative archaeology. This fascinating map, far exceeding the geographical knowledge of its time, has led some to propose that it might be based on sources from a pre-glacial era, potentially crafted by an advanced maritime civilization. Such a theory not only challenges our understanding of historical timelines, but also sparks broader discussions about the sophistication of ancient societies. 
the hypothesis of advanced ancient mariners suggests these navigators possessed the technological expertise to travel vast oceanic distances and create precise maps of their voyages. This level of proficiency would necessitate a deep understanding of astronomy, mathematics and physics, attributes that are evident in civilizations renowned for their astronomical prowess such as the Maya and the ancient Egyptians. Moreover, the widespread myths and shared architectural styles across distant ancient civilizations, such as pyramidal structures in Mesoamerica and Egypt, hint at a possible global interaction facilitated by seafaring skills. I believe that it's worth considering the possibility of a remote common ancestor, which passed down key information that was inherited by later cultures. These connections could indicate that these societies shared more than just architectural concepts, perhaps even cartographic information. Continuing with archaeological parallels, the legend of Atlantis as described by Plato, of a technologically advanced civilization lost to the sea, echoes this theory. Ooh, archaeologists hate the word Atlantis. Because they've proved that Atlantis could never have existed, even though they have not looked at the parts of the world that need to be looked at. While often regarded as a mere myth, the story of Atlantis resonates with those who theorize about prehistoric cultural exchanges mediated by a seafaring civilization. Such narratives provide a metaphorical framework that some scholars use to conceptualize real yet undiscovered advanced maritime societies. Another compelling site that aligns with this theory is Gobekli Tepe in modern-day Turkey. Huge enclosures under the ground that they haven't excavated yet. The story of Gobekli Tepe is just beginning. Dated to over 10,000 years ago, this site features sophisticated megalithic structures that predate Stonehenge by thousands of years, challenging conventional views on the development of early human societies. It's going to require us to reconsider our whole dating sequence on megalithic sites around the world. The complexity of Gobekli Tepe suggests that advanced societal structures and knowledge systems, possibly including navigation and map making, could have existed much earlier than traditionally accepted. Additionally, mysterious underwater structures like the Yonaguni Monument in Japan add to the speculation about advanced prehistoric civilizations. These formations, controversially interpreted by some as man-made, might represent remnants of a sunken civilization that had sophisticated maritime technology. Such underwater discoveries continue to fuel debates and curiosity about the extent of prehistoric human achievements and their capabilities to navigate and understand the world around them. It's fascinating to consider how archaeological discoveries could provide a foundation for legends of advanced ancient civilizations. This integration suggests that stories of seafaring gods and heroes, such as Poseidon or Gilgamesh, might not just be mythical tales, but could actually represent cultural memories of real historical figures from a globally connected ancient world. Take, for instance, the Vinland map, which surfaced in the 20th century and is purported to date back to the mid-15th century. This map includes a depiction of Vinland, a region of modern-day North America's northeast coast, famously associated with Norse explorations around the year 1000 AD. The controversy surrounding the map's authenticity, particularly debates fueled by conflicting scientific tests on the ink and parchment's age, adds a layer of mystery. If genuine, the Vinland map would be the earliest known depiction of the Americas, predating Columbus's voyages. Another intriguing comparison is with the Kangnido map, a pre-modern East Asian map from 1402, created during Korea's Joseon dynasty. This map predates both the Piri race and the Vinland maps and shows a generalized view of the known world at that time, including an oversized China and India and a recognizably outlined Arabian Peninsula. Reflecting the Joseon dynasty's keen interest in geography and its diplomatic relationships, particularly with China and Japan, the Kangnido map underscores the historical significance of cartographic knowledge in facilitating trade and diplomatic missions in East Asia. Unlike the controversial aspects of the Piri race and Vinland maps, the Kangnido map is well documented and recognized for its historical accuracy within the scope of contemporary Asian knowledge. These maps not only showcase the cartographic skills of their respective cultures, but also highlight the global nature of medieval exploration and the interconnectivity of various societies through trade, exploration and possibly even shared mythologies. 
As we delve deeper into the history of cartography, it's clear that maps from different cultures and eras offer unique insights into the geopolitical and philosophical mindsets of their creators. For instance, the Ming Dynasty maps from early 15th century China, such as the Daming Hun Yi Tu, which is an amalgamated map of the Great Ming Empire, showcase an impressive level of detail and scope. These maps presented the world from a distinctly Chinese perspective, centering on the vast expanse of the Ming Empire, while also extending to parts of Africa, Europe, and the rest of Asia. The cartographic techniques used were advanced for the time, incorporating grid systems and a consistent scale that European maps only started to use inconsistently much later. Unlike many European maps focused extensively on maritime exploration, the Ming maps prioritized land masses and political boundaries, reflecting their primary use for administrative and imperial purposes. Over 4,700 military personnel underwent rigorous training to adapt to the harsh polar conditions, marking the operation as much a human endeavor as a technological one. The expedition tested the limits of cold weather gear, from specialized clothing to heating systems, ensuring the team could operate effectively in the unforgiving Antarctic environment. There will be a number of expeditions to the bottom of the world because the government has really become interested. The technological achievements of High Jump were nothing short of revolutionary. The operation marked the first major use of helicopters and aircraft in Antarctica, transforming the logistics of polar expeditions. This fleet of snow tractors, weasels, aircraft and ships was not just tested, but proven in the polar climate, providing invaluable data for future operations in similar conditions. Beyond the scientific and logistical achievements, Project High Jump was a statement of geopolitical intent. I 100% uh, mm. believe this is a spiritual war and that these people are working with dark entities and that's what this is all about. In the shadow of the Cold War, establishing a US presence in Antarctica was a strategic move, showcasing American capabilities and interests in this remote region. The operation navigated the complex terrain of international law and diplomacy, aiming to consolidate U.S. claims and influence in Antarctica. I think there's low-frequency stuff going on, and they've made deals with people and things, and that's why I think's going on. It's clear that this was no ordinary expedition. It was a bold foray into the unknown. The establishment of Little America 4 and the extensive training and testing that took place under the harsh Antarctic conditions were all steps toward a greater understanding of our planet. The legacy of Project High Jump would eventually lead to the Antarctic Treaty System. When Admiral Richard E. Byrd spearheaded Project High Jump in the mid-1940s, he wasn't just leading an expedition. He was venturing into the unknown on a scale never before seen in Antarctic exploration. This ambitious endeavor by the United States Navy was a testament to human curiosity and the drive to push beyond conventional boundaries. With over 4,700 personnel on board, ranging from naval officers to scientists and support staff, the operation was a massive undertaking that showcased the Navy's commitment to exploring and understanding the mysteries of the Antarctic continent. The fleet for this colossal mission was just as impressive, comprising 13 ships with diverse capabilities. Among them, the USS Philippine Sea stood out, not just as an aircraft carrier, but as a floating base for aerial operations that brought unprecedented mobility and reach to the expedition. This fleet, complete with icebreakers, supply ships, and destroyers, played pivotal roles from navigating through treacherous ice to providing essential logistical support and serving as platforms for scientific research. This innovation opened new avenues for exploration and research, allowing the team to reach previously inaccessible areas. Fixed-wing aircraft were extensively used for aerial photography and mapping, covering nearly 1.5 million square kilometers of uncharted territory. This was no small feat. The aerial reconnaissance conducted during high jump was crucial for mapping the continent's geography, studying its geology, and planning future expeditions. The resulting photographs and maps became authoritative sources of Antarctic geography for years to come. The harsh and extreme conditions of Antarctica posed significant challenges, necessitating innovative technological adaptations. Everything from vehicles to aircraft and ships was modified to withstand the polar conditions. 
Special insulation, heating systems and lubricants were developed to ensure functionality in the extreme cold. These adaptations were not just crucial for the success of the expedition, they contributed to the development of technologies that would be used in cold environments worldwide. According to some, the United States Navy's expedition to the icy continent wasn't just about exploring uncharted territory. It was a covert operation to uncover something much more extraordinary. Exotic technologies or evidence of ancient civilizations buried beneath the ice. The story goes a bit like this. Tucked away in the vast, frozen landscapes of Antarctica, there might have been remnants of an advanced ancient civilization, or perhaps even a crashed alien spacecraft. Imagine that, hidden bases or technology from other worlds right here on Earth lying in wait under the ice. This theory plays into the idea that such discoveries could explain the rapid technological advancements of the period. Maybe, just maybe, the team behind Project High Jump was on the brink of uncovering secrets akin to those of Atlantis or other legendary lands, secrets that could rewrite our understanding of history and science. But let's take a step back and sift through the layers of this captivating story. When we dive into the official records and facts from the expedition, a different picture emerges. One rooted firmly in the realm of scientific exploration and research. There's no denying the operation was ambitious and groundbreaking, but its achievements lie in the contributions it made to our understanding of the Antarctic region, not in unearthing ancient tech or alien relics. Now, one of the most intriguing conspiracy theories that's been swirling around for decades, the idea that Project High Jump was actually a secret mission to uncover a German base hidden deep in the icy expanses of Antarctica. It's a tale that mixes real historical events with a hefty dose of speculation, all set against the mysterious backdrop of the Antarctic wilderness. Let's start at the beginning. Back in the late 1930s, Germany did indeed embark on an expedition to Antarctica, known as the Third German Antarctic Expedition. This venture was aimed at expanding Germany's whaling capacities and staking a territorial claim for resource extraction, naming the explored area Neuschwabenland after a region in Germany. However, despite the grand ambitions, the expedition didn't result in the establishment of a permanent base, just a fleeting brush with the icy continent. Now onto the more thrilling part of the story, the theory that the Germans conducted secret drilling operations in Antarctica. According to various speculative narratives, these operations had several possible goals. Hunting for rare minerals to power their war machine, establishing a covert base under the ice, dubbed Base 2111 or New Berlin, or even seeking out ancient knowledge or alien tech hidden in the Antarctic depths. It's the stuff of science fiction with a dash of historical intrigue, but let's pause for a reality check. The technical feats required for deep drilling in the Antarctic ice are formidable, even by today's standards. Considering the technology available in the 1930s and 1940s, the idea that they could have pulled off such a feat is highly improbable. Modern ice core drilling projects, which have successfully reached great depths, rely on sophisticated equipment and logistics that simply weren't at the Germans' disposal. But as World War II came to a close, rumors started to take flight. Stories began circulating about Germans fleeing and seeking refuge in a secret base in Antarctica, supposedly established in the wake of the Richer expedition. As the years went by, this theory found its way into various books, articles, and eventually online forums and documentaries, each iteration adding layers to the narrative. Speculations about the Germans developing advanced technology and weaponry in isolation, far from the prying eyes of the world, only served to deepen the mystery and allure of the story. Yet despite its captivating narrative, this theory remains just that, a theory.